te nā koutou kei ngā iwi kua tau mai nei ki tēnei pai kōrero, nau mai hoki mai anō kia tapatahi. Kia ora and welcome to the programme, thanks for joining us. Coming up on today's program, we speak with a queer about the Waikato DHB denying whānau access to her mokopuna, who is on life support in ICU. Troy Kingi has been awarded the Tate Music Prize 2020. He joins us and sings a waiata. Set the plans on fire. Linda Teaho discusses the government's RMA reforms and we bring you a story of Veronora Hetit, a weaver and artist who weaved a kono every day during the 33 days of lockdown. But first, here's Potaka Maipi with the news. Tēnā koe Shane. Kei aku hia kai manua mō atarau, e whaia ke nei ko ngā pitopito kōrero o te wāko pōtaka mai pi tōku ingoa. Mō te rā tuarua karapipiti, kaore he tangata ke atu ko a pāngia e te mate urutā. Ko tahi mano e whārau, waru te kauma ono te tōpū tanga tūroro. Toko whā ngā tangata kei rō hōhipera. Ko tahi mano e toru rau mā rua, ngā tangata ko a whakamāwi a ke i te mate. Ko tahi rau e rua te kaumā ono ngā uri Māori, e whitu te kaumā iwa ngā uri Pacifica kua pāngia. E toru mano e toru rau toru te kaumā rua ngā tāngata i whakamātauhia i nā nahi nei. Ko te rānga i tāpoi ka tino rongo i ngā pānga o te mate urutā, a ngā marma me ngā taukei mua i te aroaro, ko te hunga ka kaha pākia, ko ngā pākihi Māori e whakawhirinaki atuana ki te tāpoi ao e ora ai rātau. Nō reira ka aha te kāwanatanga e whakamaru i ēnei pākihi. There are certain industries that will be affected for some time, even when we get to some level of um, normalcy, just because, for instance, our borders are closed um, or there are restrictions still on mass gatherings. So we are looking at being more specific and more targeted in our support. At the same time, we also need to encourage innovation. COVID will be with us for some time as a globe, and so we do need adaptation amongst some of those different industries to cope with that new environment. Kei te tangi hotu hotu a Gail Pohipi ki ana mokopuna ki roto i te hohipira i te wānga whā omo omo e manua ki ore ana. Te taia te kuia nei te tai a tinana atu ki te noho ki te taha wāna mokopuna arā no atu ngā taiapa kei mua i aia. So I work at the Kōrau Hau. I'm a Bano Water Navigator. possible. Education, social needs, a support of a moment, health and justice to access everything possible. Education, social needs, health and justice. And I couldn't do it for my own. Ko te whakautu mai te Waikato DHB waiho mā tapatahi hei whakautu. Ko Sam Cain te kāpene hou o te kapa ōpango, engari kei te kōke whakamua tēnei kai tākoro no Waikato ki runga i te papawhutuporo e ono te kaumā waru ngā whakamā tautau mō te kapa ōpango hei tāna he hōnore nui rawa mō nā kei te tārewa ngā whakamā tautau ōpango mō te taurua mano rua te kau. A kua riro i a Troy Kingi i te tohu pūro Tate mō te kōpai the upper class holy kūpai Colony Burning Acres. Uh. Set the plans on fire. Oh. Kā tī, koi nā tā te ao Māori e pupuru nei, mo te whānui tanga atu, tēnā toro atu ki te ao Māori. News me ngā whārangi o ngā reo irirangi Māori, ka hoki anō, ki a koe Shane.
Well, to our first story today, 20-year-old Mariah Jones is on life support in ICU at Waikato Hospital after a serious car crash on April 23. Her queer Gail Poihipi says the trauma has been even more distressing because Waikato Hospital refused to allow the whanau to visit her for a week. Medical staff were also making decisions about Mariah's care without consulting them. We begin the story with Gail Poihipi talking about the tragic events of April 23rd. Uh, my two granddaughters were in an accident, a car accident. Um, Paris O'Donnell is 21 and Mariah Jones is 20 years of age and they were flown into the hospital um, from the car accident. They reached the hospital and I went in to, um, went through their process, their COVID-19 process at the ED and informed them that I was the grandmother for both girls. Um, and so they allowed me to go into ED, um, into the whānau room, where I found out that um, one was critical and the other one was um, still getting checked over and having a look at what injuries she had. I um, spoke to the doctor in that evening and he had informed me that um, Mariah had received serious injuries and that they couldn't um, they couldn't see what was wrong or give me any feedback on it at that time. I informed them that then that I wasn't the um, the grandparent that raised her, that she was whangai out of the whanau. I asked the doctors if I could have the whangai parents at the hospital, and they had told me at the time, yes, they could. Um, as I was with Paris, they could be with um, Mariah. So I phoned them to come through to the hospital and be at the bedside or wherever that would be for them in the hospital. But they were stopped outside front at ED and the doctors had to go out and then they explained to them of the seriousness of her injuries. But then they went on to say that they weren't um, permitted to be in the room or inside the hospital for her. So as much as we tried to inform them that we're two separate family um, and that they were the legal adoptive parents, uh, they still said that they couldn't have them in the hospital. They, they received a call to say that um, she might be taken off life support in two days. So um, they gave them 30 minutes visit. It was supposed to be a one-hour visit, but they gave her a 30-minute visit with her. And um, they didn't want to... Um, they didn't want to rock anybody's boat because they were they were um, afraid that that 30-minute visit would be taken off them. So when did they... When, when did the whāngai parents first have access to Mariah? Uh, Wednesday. On Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Following Wednesday. So they were informed that they could have an hour's visit and when they got to the hospital it changed to 30 minutes. Once they had that visit, they were told after that that they couldn't um, visit again. Mariah and her sister Paris were in a serious car accident on Thursday 23rd of April. The whānau that raised Mariah as a whāngai were forced to wait until the following Wednesday, almost one week later, to visit her. They were initially told they could spend one hour with her. This was cut down to 30 minutes on the day. But the whānau said they didn't react, out of fear of the visit being cancelled. The whānau says they were concerned that hospital staff were making decisions about Mariah's care without consulting them. Um, the charge nurse, the charge nurse, the doctors were saying yes, they don't see a problem, and then when it came to going 
making the call, the church needs to have the final call. But we're informed that our Māori services are working alongside to try and get our whānau bedside, but it never could. Who was making um, the decisions for Mariah's health care? The decisions about what needed to happen with her care? Not the whānau. It obviously came from the hospital, um, the doctors and the nurses. Talk to us about the opportunity that was given to the Fano. First of all, they were told they could have an hour to spend with Mariah. They're then given 30 minutes. What happened at that time? Um, <clears throat> it was the mother and, the, and her daughter that went up, uh, the older sibling, went up to the hospital and when they were told that it went down to 30 minutes, they were just so appreciative of getting anything. So if it was going to be 30 minutes and if that's all they were going to get, then they weren't going to fight the system. They weren't going to um, argue that point. Most of all, they were just fearful that they would lose the ability to, um, to, continue, to continue their visit with um, Mariah. And from that point on, it's been that way ever since. They were told at that visit that they wouldn't be able to come back and visit with her. Um, and they were told that uh, she may have to um, come off life support. And from that point on, we couldn't understand then why can't, why can't Fano be at her side if that's the case. Out of despair, the Fano reached out for support. It took the intervention of the Deputy Chair of the DHB's Māori Council for the Fano to finally be given access to their mokopuna. I work at Tukoro now. I'm a Fano Water Navigator. I support other Fano. Access to everything possible, education, social needs, health, and justice, and I couldn't do it for my own. And I'm up at the hospital, it became quite a And so I came back to work and I spoke to. Um, my CEO about where we were at and progressing forward with visits. And I reached out and um, she was able to do an email across to the hospital to inform them of the trauma and everything that the family had gone through and requested a final care plan as to a visiting plan for the family. That was at 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday of last week. And by 5 o'clock, the phone were bedside. And that's all I could have asked for. And that's all the phone I wanted. How is Mariah now? What sort of condition is she in now? She's um, showing a little bit more signs every day. Um, which is better than the information we've been getting back. Most days it's been, she's 50, 50, she's on the fence. Um, she may have to be taken off life support in two days, um, day by day. But since she's had her visit, since um, the FOMO had been able to be fed, so it's been positive. So she's not yet come out of sedation. She's making, she's showing um, positive signs. 20-year-old Mariah Jones is in ICU at Waikato Hospital after being in a serious car crash. Her queer Gail talks to us about the young, spirited wahine. As a child out, 
she had been raised with her sister. She was far my daddy, six weeks old, but I was a twin. And um, we lost her twin, six weeks, period. And she didn't get the opportunity to be raised with her sister, although they got to get on online, Facebook, and chat with one another every now and then. They would see one another in the same puppies and mud eyes because we never stopped them from interacting with one another. So, like every other Tangatangi day, she's very outgoing, um, headstrong, wants to make her own decisions, same as her sister, but they have plans. And at the moment, we're just waiting for her to wake up to continue those plans. Gail Poihepi. Well, we'd love to know your thoughts on today's programme. Please post your feedback on our Facebook page or send us an email, tapatahi at maoritelevision.com. After the break, the Deputy Chair of Waikato DHB's Māori Council joins us to talk about her intervention on behalf of Mariah's whānau. Hoki mai anō. Tūreiti Moxon is the CEO of Te Kōhau Health in Hamilton and the Deputy Chair of the Māori Council for Waikato DHB. Her intervention more than one week after the car accident saw the hospital change its approach and allow Fano to visit Mariah. Te nākwe Tūreiti, thanks for joining us. Kia ora. Kia ora Shane, kia ora koutou katoa. This is such a tragic story. Did the DHB fail Mariah and her Fano? Well, um, first of all, I'm no longer the um, Deputy Chair of the DHB's Iwi Māori Council. But uh, in terms of the situation, certainly I think that, that they could have done this a lot better. And certainly given the circumstances of the whānau, in that they were um, in a situation where they were totally powerless. And really, what they should have been doing was to support the whānau with a plan very early on in the piece, rather than waiting almost a week later to, to allow whānau to feel like they're part and parcel of her healing. Because at that, at that moment and, and point in time, they hadn't been a part of any of the decisions that were being made in relation to their mokupuna. So that, that to me was uh, very sad and certainly you could see the pain on uh, Gail um, who honestly I've been listening to this all week and Gail is one of the most um, um, uh, strongest advocates there is um, in our organisation with regard to Fana, and yet she couldn't even get um, her th these uh, Fano through the door. And so, um, yeah. So I think that um, what we forget sometimes is we think that um, healing, um, health is all about uh, the clinical side, the physical side of a, be a person's being, when there is the wairua side, the tinana, uh, the tinana, as well as the hiningaro. And that, I think, was totally overlooked. And while people were saying things were being done, nothing was being done. Just to recap, for those whānau that may be just joining us now, on the 23rd of April, Mariah and her sister were in a tragic car accident. That was a Thursday. The following Wednesday, they were given access, uh, the whānau, the whāngai whānau were given access to Mariah um, to be able to visit her for 30 minutes. Then two days later on Friday, Gail, uh, the, the grandmother, the queer of Mariah, reaches out for support. She comes to you out of despair and asks you to help. What do you do then? Well, um, I uh, emailed the CEO and the commissioner of the DHB, um, and I've got to say I did um, add in a Minister Penny Henari as well, uh, to, to say, uh, well, to voice my concerns around this whānau and their plight. And I've got to say, given, given uh, the, uh, that, um, uh, that this was um, before the CEO uh, at that moment in time in the morning, by the afternoon they had organised 
that the family, that the plan was put in place, that the family was able to see their loved one, and that, um, according to Gail, the, their loved one was able to, Mariah was able to respond, respond to them. So I, I give the DHB their due that once um, I had uh, put this before them, and it would, they wouldn't necessarily know about it either, you, you know, those, those who are at the... Uh, top of the food chain at the DHB, they they wouldn't necessarily know about about what was going on, and and you know I all my 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 um, aroha goes out to the frontline workers, but I think sometimes we take uh, we are so officious about things that what we don't see is the importance of having fun of having loved ones close to someone who whose fate they didn't even understand and know. Um, what it would be going forward. And so, yes, and I've got to say, it just happened, and then thank goodness that it was a, a good ending to it all. Absolutely. So Friday morning, you send an email off to the, the chiefs of the DHB, including the Associate Health Minister, Pini Henare. By the afternoon, a plan is in place that enables the whānau, the whāngau whānau, to be able to visit their, their baby, Mariah, who's lying in intensive care, in the hospital, and she is now, once the whānau are given access to her, she, she now responds. They can see an improvement in her condition. The question that I have for you, why does it take a third party like yourself to have to intervene to raise this issue with chiefs of the DHB and a minister for whānau to be given access to their loved one? Exactly. And it shouldn't have to be like that. And um, Māori should have access to their loved ones um, at any point in time. Even though, um, like, um, you know, we've had uh, the situation change on us with COVID. Even though we've had the situation change on us, I think our people have been very, very compliant. They have supported it. They've looked after themselves. And and whatnot, but I think that um, it was um, the decision making of someone who is extremely officious and extremely um, I don't know whether whether it was because she felt um, empowered to do that herself without um, involving Fano. I'm not sure of the circumstances, but I I pray and hope that it's not going to happen again to anyone. But as I say to everyone, we, you know, we have to stand up for what we believe and we have to stand up for what's right for us, you know, tika and puno. And not everybody who is in places of power has the ability to understand that. We do have to acknowledge, as you rightly say, that we are in unprecedented times with COVID-19. But this just strikes me of using common sense, right? You don't need a degree to apply common sense in the situation where Fano, who are already uh, experiencing the trauma of having a loved one uh, being in a car accident and then being denied access to their loved one, don't we just use common sense in this type of situation? Well, you'd think so, but it isn't always the case. And certainly this is one of those cases where it it didn't come through at all. And I'm not sure what she was, um, what what uh, the person who was in charge of the uh, ICU ward was thinking. She may well have had two reasons, but no one knew what those reasons were. And the doctor certainly didn't know those reasons because they actually allowed um, visits to happen. So, you know, in the end, the person in charge of the ward is the person, I guess, who has the power to make those decisions. But, um, as you say, you think common sense would prevail? Well, as you can see, that's not always the case. And I don't want to labour the point. Um, I, I, I acknowledge, though, that you are a key driver behind the health claim that is currently before the Waitangi Tribunal. Because while this incident may be isolated, it does, does it not, demonstrate uh, that our system is broken when it comes to working with Māori. Working with Māori, which is really at the core of your treaty claim. 
right? Can you tell us where the claim is currently at? Yes, yes, of course. Um, the claim, we had um, uh, the hearing last year for the uh, primary health claim, and um, we had um, the tribunal came out with their interim report. And that interim report did highlight quite clearly the concerns um, around racism, around um, institutional racism, personal racism, and the fact that Māori are not getting the services that they require when they require it. And um, certainly I think this is an example of that. Um, and the other thing that they, they've said is that Māori are underfunded, extremely, Māori providers are extremely underfunded and have been underfunded for a number of years since we took the claim in 2005. Um, they've also said that um, that we should explore with, with the Crown the, um, uh, the uh, or a, uh, um, a funding authority that actually supports Māori health. And that's one of the things that, uh, well, two of the things that we have been um, working with the Ministry of Health to get through. Unfortunately, the cap Cabinet had made a decision uh, prior to COVID that, um, that they did not support it at that time and they were waiting on the um, Simpson report. Well, as we know, the Simpson report has been held up because, because the Minister didn't want to accept it at that moment of time because of COVID. Of course, he's got his own problems himself out right now. So I don't know how long he will be the Minister of Health, but however, that's another co-papa, another tucky. So, um, <clears throat> yes, so, so, so basically we're kind of in no man's land really around that. There is a second part to that, to, to that, the health claims, and those ones um, are going to come up, hopefully all being well in the, or start anyway, the hearings um, at the end of the year or near the end of the year. But the tribunal has yet to make a decision around that, depending on how ready everybody is. Well, thank you for that update, and thank you uh, for joining us uh, this morning. We do hope to have the current health minister on the programme sometime soon, so we'll certainly put some of these questions to him. Tūreiti Moxon, tēnā roa tukwe, thank you for joining us this morning. Kia Well, when we approached the Waikato DHB, it responded by saying there was a daily visitor plan in place for some time for nominated family members. Two could visit Mariah each day. The DHB also said Fano were involved in Mariah's care plan and kept informed of changes. The hospital also communicated directly with designated next of kin about Mariah's care. That person was responsible for including other Fano members. Waikato DHB didn't comment any further on Gail's specific claims because of patient privacy. Well, soon we'll talk with Troy Kingi, winner of the prestigious Tate Music Prize 2020, and what this means for him. But first, here's Portaka Maipi with your news headlines. Tēnā koe Shane, kei aku hui a kai manua, mō a tarau e whaia ke nei ko ngā pito pito kōrero o te wā, ko pōtaka mai pito ko ingoa. Mō tērā tuarua karapipiti, kaore he tangata ke atu ko a pāngia e te mate uruta. Ko te kaupapa nui o te rā, kei te kiwa kiwa a Gail Pohipi, kei roto i te hohipira āna mokopuna i te wāhanga whā o mōmo e manua ki ori ana. Te tai a te kuia nei te tai a tinana atu, Kia noho ki te taha o ana mokopuna, a rā noa atu ngā taiapa kei mua i aia. Um, so I, I work at Te Kōhau Hau. I'm a Bāna Water Navigator. I support of a Bāna access to everything possible, education, social needs, health and justice, and I couldn't do it for my own. Ko te whakautu o DHB Waikato, ko a whakaritea mai, he mahere rautaki mō ngā manuwhiri e rua no te whānau, kia noho ki te taha o Maraia. Ko te whakautu anō, 
ko ngā wangawanga o Gael, kei raro i te ture tū mata iti. I toro atu te tāhuhurangapu o Kōhau Haora, a ture te Moxon ki te āwhina i te whānau. Um, what we forget sometimes is we think that um, healing, um, health is all about uh, the clinical side, the physical side of a, be a person's being, when there is the wairua side, the tinana, uh, the tinana, as well as the hiningaro. And that, I think, was totally overlooked. And while people were saying things were being done, nothing was being done. Akati. Koi rā ngā kaupapa matua mo tēnei wā, ka hoki ki anō ki a koutou o tapatahi. Troy Kingi has been awarded the Tate Music Prize 2020 for his album Troy Kingi in the Upper Class, Holy Colony Burning Acres. The award highlights outstanding New Zealand albums released in the past calendar year. Troy describes it as a personal and spiritual examination of the plight of First Nations peoples around the world. The award was presented to Troy last night by Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern via live stream. We have Troy here on the show today. Te narawatu koe, Troy. Thank you for having me today. Congratulations on uh, the award that you were uh, given last night. Now, we know it's not the first major award you've won for this album. How do you feel? Um, flabbergasted more than anything. Um, just the caliber of finalists that um, they were up for the award. Um, man, I thought I actually had no chance of winning that award. So to come come away with it is, uh, I'm still processing it. It's it's awesome. The album delves into the dark corners of worldly indigenous politics, namely colonisation and its crippling effects on today's social climate. Why was it so important for you to highlight this in the album? To be honest, it was probably because of the genre of music I was, um, that particular album was about. Um, it's a given that because I was wanting to do this old Roots album that it was going to be political. Um, and I don't know, being Māori, um, that, that was the only political route I could, I could think of. And it was just timely with what was happening last year with with Ihumato and Mona Kea and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Are you naturally a political person? No, no. Um, and that's it. Like that, that's why this album was so hard for me. Um, I was questioning whether I should even be saying this stuff or whether. My voice was important, um, all, all these sorts of things. But in the end, um, I don't know, I, I just felt compelled to just just do what I was doing and um, hopefully people resonated with it. It's quite a, a different uh, type of genre or kaupapa uh, for you to be uh, singing to. Mm. Do, do you think that? Or, or has this always been part of... Uh, your singing? Well, that's just it. Um, the big plan, uh, that, that was my third album, so the plan is to do 10 albums in 10 years in 10 different genres. So um, it, I'm hoping that each album is going to be standalone um, and so they should be different from each other. As part of the prize, you've won 12500 in cash, as well as studio recording time at Red Bull Studios in Auckland. How is this going to help you with your mahi? Um, for starters, it's going to help me pay for my musos. Um, uh, I've got six more albums to go, so hopefully I can get a few more exotic um, musicians on there, ones you have to call up from the middle of the jungle or in the desert or something. Um, yeah, it's going to help me a lot. How has the lockdown been for you? How has COVID-19 affected your ability to write music, to sing? Uh, because we know, right, uh, the crisis has certainly affected so many musicians uh, in recent weeks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a homebody anyway. I, it hasn't changed much for me. <laughs> Uh, I do most of my writing alone at home, 
So um, the only the biggest thing that it's done is it's closed down all our live concerts, which is our main revenue stream, which which is a little bit tough. But um, I've actually enjoyed it being home with my kids, and um, it's just been a good time to reflect and slow down. Well, it's interesting you raise um, concerts and performing live. Have you been thinking about different ways in which you may be able to do this, especially if large gatherings are still banned uh, in the coming months? Yeah, um, I've been approached to do a lot of um, uh, live streaming gigs. Um, I haven't done any yet, but um, it seems like there's going to be a lot more of that happening and... It's been it's been actually cool just being able every weekend just to be able to tune in into people's live streams, um, listen to people that you might not listen to, um, and save heaps of money on tickets because you're just tuning in for free to these bloody dudes that are down in um, Dunedin or Christchurch. Um, it's been really cool. So that's that's going to be um, the way of the future. I think a lot more live streaming. You mentioned earlier your goal of completing 10 albums and 10 genres in 10 years. What mahi are you working on right now? And uh, yeah, what, what are you doing right now? Uh, the album I'm working on at the moment is called The Ghost of Freddie Caesar. Um, it's somewhat of a covers album um, of kind of a mysterious artist uh, from the 70s. Um, I was about a week off finishing it before we got went into lockdown so been itching to get back down into the studio down in Auckland and finish it off so hopefully we get to level two soon so I can go down and smash it. <laughs> well you're going to smash it shortly because you've sent us um, one of your songs that we're going to play very shortly. Can you tell us about the waiata uh, that we're going to share with everyone uh, shortly? Yeah this song's called Trigger Nini. Um, it's the last track off the Holy Colony album, and it's actually about uh, one of our sisters from Ahitradia, um, Truganini, who was the last, well, said to be the last full-blooded um, Aboriginal from Tasmania. Um, I actually watched the documentary, and it just, I actually, I don't know, I just started crying <laughs> when I watched it, and... Um, it just felt like it could have been a nanny or anyone. And, um, yeah, it's one of my favourite songs on the album anyway. Troy, thanks so much uh, for joining us this morning and congratulations again for the award last night. Here's your waiata uh, for everyone to enjoy. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. She's a goddess of the dream time Evade of the black night Around the world It's a reoccurring thing Truganini Everybody wants the simplest things They want hope, they want love No voice from above It's the truth And it echoes through the ages
in the river behind the mountain. Give my own to the bloodline. It's up to them. How the story ends, true. We'd love to know your thoughts on today's programme. Please post your feedback on our Facebook page or send us an email, tapatahi at maoritelevision.com. Coming up after the break, we speak with Linda Tiaho about the government's RMA reforms. The government is looking to bypass the Resource Management Act for a couple of years in an effort to get infrastructure pro projects off the ground and stimulate the economy. This means public and council consultation has been removed and now their affairs protection of the environment and treaty rights are at risk. Ko te pōhiri mai a dibi ngā rewa peka i te whakarau oratanga o te ohanga, he oe ke te āwangawanga hoki ia, ka pēhea a ngai Māori. And I guess... We need to make sure that, it, that we are progressing and fast-tracking things for the right reasons and the sense of urgency is going to match what we need urgently as Māori and it's uh, not something that's going to undermine the rights of us as Māori or as the community. Ko tētahi o ngā marohi matua o tāte kā wanatanga whakaaro ke whakatere te ohanga ka hohoni te ture whakamanawa rawa e meana me kōrero tahi ki ngā kaunihera ki ngā rōpū hapori anō hoki. Ka noho mā te minita take tai ao me te tahi opa eti e whakatau kō wai ngā hinonga ka whai take. But let's look at jobs that are where people can clean up our awa. Let's look at mahi where we can do pest control. Let's look at our local economy that have previously been looked, looked past because they haven't fitted the the, the common you know, western centric bill. Ko ngā hinonga kaitā e rā kei te whakaarotia e te kā wanatanga. He tāte hea mana o ngā tiruanui me whaitake hoki ngā hinonga hapuri whakatika tai ao. There are some, some process challenges. There are, I wonder how they're going to deal with some of the challenges that are just going to bring unrest from an iwi Māori perspective or whānau perspective. And who will be the intermediary? Ki te mana te pire nei ka hiki nā noa hei te rua tau e tū mai nei. Ko tā ngā rewa peka titiro e toru ngā ngaru nui ka heke mai i awa tau e rua. However, it is going to last for two years. And I would imagine the first wave is, is going to be some big infrastructure. It's going to be interesting to where the last wave in the two years is going to go. So we need to be really um, vigilant in making sure that uh, there's accountability. Nō no tērā wiki putai te kāhui minita ngā panoni tanga hei te marama e tū mai nei pea, ta mana te pire. James Perry, te ao Māori. With me now to discuss this further is Associate Dean Māori of Law at Waikato University, Linda Tia. Ho tēnā koe, Linda. Ho tēnā. Māori consultation in the RMA process has been dumped. Does this worry you? I think it's a concern um, for all people, actually, not just for Māori, because public consultation is a fundamental premise of the uh, uh, Resource Management Act. Uh, the, the Act was um, passed to provide a fair opportunity for everyone to be able to have a voice in decisions that affect them and the places that they care about. And the Resource Management Act was seen as a world-leading piece of legislation because it had particular provisions that were intended to ensure that Māori had a voice in those decisions. David Parker, the minister, says the normal consent and approval path is too slow. But is this a dangerous precedent that the government is setting? I, I actually do agree with the Minister. Even outside of the COVID uh, crisis, the Resource Management Act um, hasn't always pulled its weight. Uh, its processes uh, cost too much, they take too long, and they haven't, haven't protected the environment. Um, and uh, the Māori voice has been lost in the balance of other considerations. So um, there actually have been lots of... Um, 
proposals to overhaul the resource management even before COVID hit. So, and that's why Māori have turned to treaty settlements to achieve stronger mechanisms to ensure that they have a voice in decision making, um, such as relationship redress with councils. Um, so I think there is a danger in terms of the rush in getting this legislation passed um, that there won't be meaningful engagement with iwi, tangata whenua, who know the local places very well and have uh, responsibilities to protect those places and their taonga. Would you like to see a group set up, uh, an expert advisory group, for example, set up to help provide the minister with uh, a Māori perspective on these changes and what they mean for Māori? I understand that there already is a pandemic response group that has been established by the Iwi Leaders Forum and some of the technicians have been involved in the legislation behind the scenes. Uh, the difficulty there is that the Crown has an obligation to deal with all iwi, with every iwi, and um, that's part of its treaty obligations. And so uh, I think that what is needed is co-design of the legislation, and this is something that this government government knows well, it worked well, it's worked well in the past uh, for them, and so I'm a little surprised that they haven't called upon iwi, because we're, we're not just kaitiaki in, in the narrow sense of being protectors and advocates, we certainly are that, but we are also developers and employers, and we have an interest too in reinvigorating the economy in a post-COVID world. So it makes sense to, to to engage uh, with iwi um, uh, in a close and meaningful way because we are the ones that have been advocating for balanced development uh, all the way through. The RMA has been the subject of much debate, as you point out, for many, many years. And there is a view that the government is using COVID-19 uh, as an opportunity to fast track the process. Now, I, I acknowledge that you did say before that the, the process needs to be fixed and could be improved. Uh, but what, what, what view do you take? Is, is, is this uh, an opportunistic uh, government uh, trying to uh, improve something that they may not be able to get right, especially if they don't include Māori as part of that process? Well, it is an opportunity. Um, you know, I've heard somebody say, don't waste uh, the opportunities that come with a crisis to get things through. And people who are focusing on other things, um, you know, may miss the consultation. But but I think, I actually think that there, there could be benefits that come through this process. Uh, as I've said, I, I do think that there need to be improvements to the Resource Management Act. But there must be... Um, meaningful engagement with iwi and co-designing the processes going forward. I think that sometimes there's this perception of Māori as barriers to development. And as I've said before, actually we, we are advocates for development, but we would like to see development uh, taking place in, um, in a way that accords with our worldview that values the environment and values the rights of future generations to enjoy that environment too. A nice place to end it. Linda Te Aho, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Ka nui te mihi ki koe. koe. And we will have the Minister David Parker on tomorrow's programme and we'll put uh, Linda's views to him as well. Well, as most of us know, a kono is a woven flax basket traditionally used to serve food. But for weaver and artist Veronoa Hittit, weaving a nest of kono over the last 33 days of lockdown was a way to help connect to her loved ones and cope with the difficulties of isolation. Veronoa, tēnā koe, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Morning. Talk to us about uh, kono. What is a kono and... Why is it so special, the, 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 the work that goes into making a kono so special to you? Uh, the kono is special to me because it was one of the very first things that my mother taught me when I was a young girl. And um, it is something that I enjoy weaving because it reminds me of that time, that time that I spent with my mother. Um, working on such a simple basket, but in learning how to weave that basket, learning so much more, uh, learning how to prepare harakeke, learning how to 
prepare oneself um, following all the tikanga um, surrounding the gathering and the working with Harakiki. So in that simple all-cornered basket are and were a lot of lessons. What do you think about when you think of your mum and that time when she first started teaching you how to make a kono? Well, I remember when I was a teenager and I was, um, I was a little bit envious of my cousins, um, all going out to the movies and going to the swimming pool and going to the beach. And, and I was often at home with mum weaving. And at that time, I felt really envious of my cousins. But looking back now, I can see that what my mother was doing was preparing me for my life. Uh, how many kono did you make uh, during the lockdown period? Um, I made 33 because we were in lockdown for at level four for 33 days and so uh, there is a kono uh, representing each one of those days and it was an interesting exercise for me um, and I found that over time um, I fell in love with the kono all over again but also you know, I've been weaving for a, a, a lot of years and I became immune to the smell of flax. And because I was weaving with this freshly prepared flax every day, my home was suddenly filled again with the smell of flax. And so that was interesting for me that um, that was all coming back to me and the memories of my mum were coming back to me as well. Um, my sister and I, my sister Lillian and I, run the Hitchit School of Māori Art, which is an online school for weaving. And early on in the Level 4 lockdown, we decided to share our joy of weaving with the world and so made available a free lesson in the gathering of harakeke, the preparation of harakeke and the weaving of a kono. And as a result, there are now 7,000 people throughout the entire world who have joined into my, I guess, weaving bubble. And it felt, it felt um, heartwarming for me to know that I was weaving the same thing with so many other people in the, in the world. So How does that practically happen uh, in terms of you sharing your gift and talent uh, with so many people across the world? Uh, and especially when they may not have access to harakeke? Oh, there's lots of things that you can weave with. Um, so I have students who um, cut up their calendar the month of March because they, they didn't need that. So they cut their calendar up, up into strips and they wove a, a kono with that. Um, some people have woven kono out of... Um, cut up cereal boxes. I have one here. So that's a Coco Pops kono. And, so, and that's wonderful because you can learn how to create a kono and also use up some of the rubbish that is collecting in your home. I mean, you can, it's the, the, the whole thing about sharing this kono lesson was to give people the gift of creating and to give them the gift of being able to get yourself out of what was going on in the world and focus on your hands and focus on creating something. Vera Noor, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We do really appreciate your time and the opportunity um, to listen to your experience over the lockdown period and the amazing gift and talent that you're sharing with people right across the world. Tēnā koe. Well, thank you to our guests and thank you for joining us. Koe nā tapatahi mo tēnei rā, kia piki te ora te kaha me te maramatanga kia koutou katoa, hei ko nā mo tēnei wā.